sacrifice, covenant promises, and redemption. Those are the themes that run through our readings this morning. In our first reading, Abraham, in the complete obedience to God, is willing to sacrifice his son. Because of Abraham's willingness to obey the covenant promise to make him the ancestor of many nations is renewed. The story of Abraham's willingness to obey God's request, as mentioned, to offer his son up for sacrifice, has many powerful ideas for us to ponder this morning. It must have been very challenging for Abraham to be requested to sacrifice the very offspring through whom the covenant promise of a future nation was supposed to come. Abraham placed hope in Isaac, his child, as the child of the promise that God had made to Abraham that a promise to raise a nation from Abraham's descendants. In verses that were omitted from this morning's reading, Abraham's son is the one that carries the wood of the sacrifice up the hill to, play, to the place where the offering was to be made. This foretells the time when another son will carry the wood of the cross up the hill of sacrifice called Golgotha, otherwise known as Calvary. God stops the human sacrifice and provides an animal sacrifice in its place. This is meant to remind us that God does not want descendants of Abraham to make human sacrifices as the surrounding nations do. <clears throat> the place where this all happened is called Yahweh Yariah. This translates to God provides or God sees to it. This reminds us that although we may be willing to make sacrifices, it is God who provides the perfect sacrificial offering in the death and resurrection of his son. In the second reading, St. Paul's letter to the Romans uses an imagery of a legal case. Paul reminds his readers that God does not want to condemn us. If God is willing to sacrifice his son, then God does not want to condemn us. The second Sunday in Lent, which is today, in all, in all three years of our reading cycles is always the account of the transfiguration. This one that we read this morning was Mark's version. Jesus takes his three trusted disciples, Peter, James, and John, up a mountain. There he is transfigured to his rightful state of glory, a state he will receive once again after his death and resurrection. He is pictured as radiating light. He converses with Moses and Elijah. These are the two key figures of the old covenants through the law and through the prophets. Thus, Jesus is the fulfillment of all the covenants and all the promises there have ever been. The voice of God resonates showing his divine favor in Jesus. After his transfiguration, Jesus tells his disciples not to tell others until after his death and resurrection. You see, he links his glorification to his sacrificial death. At this time, this is incomprehensible to his disciples. They don't know what he's talking about. This divine relationship is ours if we accept the covenant that God is offering us. This special covenant demands sacrifice. The key sacrifice is not done by us. Jesus has already done it through his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. Our sacrifice is giving glory to God giving him praise and thanks for his son Jesus' sacrifice. 
God is the initiator and the end point of our covenant relationship. We are made holy by the Holy One of God making the sacrifice for us. God is the one who was wronged by our sinfulness. And it is God who has brought about our forgiveness in and through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus. What should be our response? Nothing can measure up to what God has done for us in and through Jesus. The best response, still insufficient in comparison to what Jesus has done, is to give glory and thanks and to share with others the message of how loving God is. My friends, turn to the psalm for today. Pray with our psalm from today. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant through the son of your handmaid. You have loosed my bonds. To you will I offer sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord.